Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the food transformation uh, system, food system transformation session and land use. I will be the moderator for this uh, session. My name is Hiroko Kuniya, and I'm the executive uh, director for the SDGs project for the Asahi Shimbun. Um, food is about everybody. Currently, our food system is unsustainable for the people and for the planet. COVID-19 exposed to us very clearly how the food system is vulnerable to sudden disruptions. It is a situation that we're facing is what World Food Program calls a hunger pandemic. So we are regressing on what we have achieved on the SDGs. Globally, two billion people do not have access to safe, nutritious, and sufficient food. Millions of people go hungry and go to bed hungry at night. And also the food system, the impact on the environment is very serious. Roughly a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions is from food system. It is the largest single driver of land degradation and massive deforestation and biodiversity loss. Also, if I can add one more point, is that about 30% of the food is wasted or lost. Now looking ahead, we are facing unprecedented population growth. Right now, the global population is 7.7 .7 billion and it is growing at towards 10 billion in 2050. The planet must feed 10 billion people. So the challenge we face is that we need to produce more at the same time, protect and restore the environment, create a sustainable resilient food system that is inclusive and improves livelihoods of the farmers. The food system needs to be therefore radically, radically transformed very quickly. How can we put effective actions on track, bring solutions to scale, to reshape the food system? Now, let me introduce our panel. We had a fantastic panel. First, the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, Mark Rutte. Netherlands is a leading exporter of agricultural products and services. The country has been the in the cutting edge in transforming the efficiency of the food system. Next, Jeffrey Liu Mingfang. He's the chief executive officer of China Mengnu Dairy. It is the largest dairy company in China, and China is expected to see significant increase in the demand for food, including dairy products. Next. Geraldine Machat is the co-chief executive officer and chief financial officer of the Royal DSM. Royal DSM is the leader in the food space, working to advance sustainability and the nutrition agenda. Last but not least is David Beasley, executive director of the United Nations World Food Program. WFP was awarded the 2020 Nobel Peace Prize, and it stands at the forefront to support people who are suffering from hunger. Thank Welcome, you, thank you all for joining us. Now, <laughs> to put it straightforwardly, the food system is extremely complex. Experts say, if we want to transform the food system, we need technological transformation, we need um, behavioral transformation, and we need policy transformation. But I think I'd like to focus a little bit on the potential that we have on the technology and innovation um, in the beginning of this session. Um, if we are going to achieve agricultural sector that is good for people and the planet, um, Mr. Prime Minister, <clears throat> I'd like to ask you the Netherlands the agricultural sector has been the leader in transforming efficiency of the food system. What role must innovation play? 
and which are the areas where collective action can be transformative shaping the food system? First of all, good morning from the Netherlands and uh, thank you all for participating. And uh, uh, Mrs. Hiroko, Hiroko Kunia, thank you so much for moderating, uh, moderating this uh, very important uh, session. Uh, I, I, I think we could easily say that COVID-19 uh, has shown that if um, um, the scientific community, uh, but also the public and private sectors and civil organizations and individuals, if they all <clears throat> feel this sense of urgency and perform global collective action, that we can tackle these emergencies together. And that means we have, to, I, I believe, to focus on three things. One is, of course, the UN Food Systems Summit in September. Uh, we simply have to make sure that it will be a success. Um, and uh, I believe uh, it should be a moment we can look back on as a, um, a turning point. Uh, secondly, uh, to your point, um, Madam Moderator, the science and data, because they have proven key in tackling uh, the crisis uh, for COVID-19 and play a crucial role in addressing uh, the climate uh, crisis. Uh, and similarly, uh, science should be more visibly uh, visible um, in a way to inform us how we improve policies, how we improve food production and markets for food. Uh, in the near future, as we all know, we'll need to feed uh, 10 billion people uh, worldwide. And then third, uh, the role of businesses in the uh, agri-food sector uh, should be stimulated. And I'm so happy that uh, uh, the company we are very proud of, that it is based in the Netherlands, Royal DSM, is also part of this panel. So the role of businesses in the agri-food sector should be stimulated and able to create scalable uh, solutions. And here I'd like to highlight a, a World Economic Forum initiative in this regard, the World Economic uh, Forum Food uh, Innovation Hubs. And these hubs in Africa, in Asia, in South America and in Europe uh, will allow uh, businesses to connect regional stakeholders to skill innovations, because this is key, uh, skill innovations that can address food systems, challenge, food systems challenges. And here uh, I'm particularly proud to announce that the Netherlands will host the Global Coordinating Secretariat of the World Economic Forum Food Innovation Hubs which will connect all other food innovation hubs. And I believe this is important because it will be facilitating to create uh, the partnerships we need. So it's all three together, the UN, science and data, but also the role of uh, the business community and how to leverage and scale up uh, what is happening there. So that will be my first reaction, Madam Moderator, to your question. Mr. Prime Minister, I think uh, for many of the viewers there, it's the first time they are hearing about the um, innovation, food innovation hubs. And so if you may uh, explain a little bit more about what the objective is and what the significance is, um, why do you are making regional um, innovation hubs? What is the objective? Well, to, to be very clear, what, what, we, uh, what we need to do here, it, it, it particularly has to do with the role of, yes, science and uh, data. It has to do, of course, with the UN system, but particularly here what we need to achieve is that uh, the role of um, the business community uh, and the way they can help us to create these solutions. But then particularly the, the, the question, and I, I had this discussion many times with the big companies here in the Netherlands, Unilever, uh, Royal DSM, others in the, in the food sector. How can we not only make use in our countries of what is happening in these companies, but these companies themselves have a worldwide reach. So it's, it's not just uh, uh, the world community or governments which will enable the scalability. We also need here the, uh, the impact of uh, the business uh, community. And to support this, um, it, it's crucial uh, that we have, um, and this is a particular new initiative by the World Economic Forum, that we have these innovation hubs. But then, if you would have them only at a global level, we all feel that we would miss out in terms of what is needed in particular areas. And that is why we uh, need them in the regions, uh, we think in the, yeah, in, in the big uh, geographical regions like Africa and Asia, but also South America and Europe. 
so that we have the business community to connect with in these areas the regional stakeholders and that is particularly important because otherwise these innovations cannot get scaled um, maybe we'll hear later from uh, Geraldine uh, Machet from uh, Royal DSM on what they are doing uh, in the area of uh, food security they're doing some fantastic research uh, and when I'm in New Zealand or wherever I'm in the world uh, I, I am confronted with these innovations by Royal DSM but then the question is how do you make sure that they get not only scalable in the Western world, but also in Africa uh, and in, uh, uh, in Asia uh, at large? But also, but when you have these regional hubs, of course, it's also crucially important that we somehow connect what is happening there. And that is why we are so proud here uh, to host this global uh, coordinating secretariat. Okay. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, I think I will ask you about the importance of these hubs a little bit later on. But uh, since you mentioned Geraldine, um, I would be very much interested in hearing about what DSM is doing in trying to uh, uh, improve sustainability in the food system with the technologies and the researches that you're doing. Thank you very what much. What is the role of, role of innovation? Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. And I have to say, we're extremely excited by this announcement that's coming out today. It is the culmination of quite a lot of work that's been going on already um, in the pre-UN Food Summit, uh, System Summit that is coming up in 2021. And uh, to give you a few examples, here are the three areas where I think these innovation hubs are going to be critical. In our view, firstly, the farmer needs to earn more when producing food sustainably. Now, this is very, very much doable, whether it is through carbon sequestration, regenerative agriculture, no-tilling technologies, more biodiversity. These are all examples where the science is there, and we have a lot of colleagues that are more upstream in the food system, whether it be Syngenta or Yara, who are doing a lot of work on these things with the ministries, with the uh, uh, organizations, civil society as well. So there's a whole part of, if we truly want to change the food systems, the farmers need to be better off when they do the right things for the planet and for the consumers. So that's one area. And we mentioned amongst others, there's a lot of talk about carbon sequestration in soil, but there's also, of course, reducing methane from livestock, one of the most impactful greenhouse gas. And the science is there, but connecting all of the players to scale it has always been the biggest challenge. So that's one area. Farmers need to be better off when they do the right things. The second area is consumers need to have more choice and realize that diets matter. And you mentioned, Madam Moderator, in your introductory comments, the impact of the COVID crisis. Now, one thing we have certainly noticed in this crisis, and it is a sad reflection of maybe a lot of societies, is that parts of our societies have been hit much more than others, financially by losing their jobs, limited access to medical care, but also a lower nutritious status. And the relationship between general health and nutrition and resilience when there's such a crisis is critical. So the nutritional content of food and having the right diets is not just an option. It's not a luxury. It is something that countries need to help in putting in place. Now, all the players in the food system need to collaborate for this, but it has to be both a policy decision, a supply decision, and an innovation decision. And here again, the technology exists. So the nutritional status of people, the ability to change that exists. So that's the third area. And then you need to connect it all. And this is all about transparency. And here there's again a lot of innovation and technology. It's about connecting the supply side with the demand. It's about having the farm to fork transparency so that people can truly make the right choices and we can help the different players across the value chain. But for that requires legislation and technology put together. So these hubs are absolutely the right way forward. And we're certainly very excited um, about the announcement, um, but also the fact that we, we feel that we can truly contribute with this in place. And I'm not even referring here to, you know, the fact that it's regional. And I'm sure David Beasley will be very eloquent in highlighting the different needs of different geographies, um, because the mindset and the needs of Europe, for instance, or Asia, very different from Africa. And there is technology innovation available for all, but it needs to be customed for the region. They're really different challenges in different places. 
Thank you, Geraldine. Um, before I go to David Beasley, I think I'd like to uh, ask um, Jeffrey, um, you're the largest uh, dairy producer in uh, China, and uh, what is your reaction to this initiative? And where do you think you can play a role? Um, great, thank you, thank you. Um, good afternoon for those who are in Asia. I'm uh, Jeffrey from uh, Mengnu Dairy, um, one of the largest dairy companies in China. Now, I probably will take the COVID-19 impact as the example. This is a typical disconnection of the entire supply chain, which is actually, you know, from farm to desk, the waste and efficiency loss are largely, you know, increased, which resulted an even bigger impact on the sustainability of the food system. So COVID-19 is probably a, just um, a amplification of the problems that we already have existing in the, for, for quite some long time. Now in our industry, actually, you know, people who have been very, very um, well known that the dairy industry have a very long um, supply chain, as well as, you know, even on the, on the finished product perspective, we have a, a range of big um, products. But if I just to focus on one thing, which is, uh, as mentioned by already Geraldine, the transparency of demand and the supply and to bring that into a data platform so that you will significantly increase the efficiency and also reduce the waste along the chain. Taking a very simple example, in, in the system we have been starting to work on is we know exactly you know, how much of you know, the, the feeds we have to grow in the very beginning and how much we have to produce at the, at the, at the farm side as well as in the, in the feeding system and then in the manufacturing system. So when you have all these data available and we are talking about also a large scale, today we are produce roughly around 9 million tons of product each, you know, each year, right? If you look at that scale, and if you look at if we can already put some of the data transparency in, in the system, we can reduce a lot of the waste. We can reduce a lot of the CO2 emission along the logistic system where we are moving around almost 10 million, you know, uh, ton of foods, right? So these are all the things we have you know, being doing in a large scale to shorten the distance between uh, demand and supply by implementing the data system and the transparency along the entire chain so that, you know, you will see a significant um, improve in the efficiency uh, on the food system itself. And then obviously the other area um, I, we are also very focusing on is on the nutrition system, what is the not, right nutrition through education, because we are reaching almost 90%, 90% of the Chinese family, you know, with, you know, 1.4 billion people. So along the way that we are moving a lot of the effort to the education of what is the right level of nutrition and also about food waste, etc. But all these will have to do based on a, a data and technology improvement, based on a large scale application along the way with all the partners who are working with us today. So I, I think, you know, I, I'm being very excited about this because this will be a full transformation of a very old industry, which is dairy, into, into a new era, which is you know, basically we starting putting all the platform in place so that everybody and our partners, our consumer, our farmers can see that and the efficiency will significantly uh, be improved. Right. Um, David, thank you for waiting. Um, I have two questions for you. One is, um, Jeffrey just talked about the potential of technologies, how that could improve uh, sustainability or the um, efficiency. What have you seen on the ground um, through helping people in this very difficult situation? How um, technology has um, provided better um, outreach for the people 
And also, secondly, this initiative that um, the minister introduced um, gears to custom-made approaches for transforming the food system. So having been on the ground, why do you believe custom-made approaches are necessary? So two questions. What technologies have you utilized in helping people throughout COVID? And why custom-made approaches? Roko, great. I'll, I'll give all that to you about an hour, and uh, I'll try to do it in about a minute and a half. <laughs> but, you know, as the prime minister was saying, you've got to really look at this at a geographical, uh, regional context, because what may be working in the mountainous areas of Afghanistan won't necessarily work in Niger or Mali or Burkina Faso. So you've you really got to look at the global context and what works in different places. And that's why the innovation accelerator that we do using e-commerce, cell phones, to connect farmers to markets, as well as buyers to different markets as well. We're, we've got that going on. We spent about $300 million last year uh, in just this type of technology and innovation. And so the Innovation Hub, I think that's just rolling out, and it's really going to have a major, major impact. But, you know, in some places, and this is what we need to think about, because it's two very different contexts. One is you look, as you said, Hiroko, the population of Earth will be about 10 billion people in a couple of years. We're struggling now because 700 million people go to bed hungry. 270 million because of COVID are on the, on the really on the brink of starvation. Now, imagine what's going to happen when we get to 10 billion people. And so right now, the struggles are po mostly in the poor countries, but what's, what do you think is gonna happen when we don't have enough food in Brussels or in Chicago or Berlin? So you've gotta look at the poor countries and the wealthy because we're talking about supply chain disruptions along with better technologies, e-commerce, hydroponics, what we're doing now with, like in Algeria, uh, blockchain technology, satellite imagery, all the new technology, better seeds, better fertilizers. But in some of the countries, in some of the innovation, what we're doing now, we used to just bring food in. Now we're putting a couple of billion dollars worth of monies into the local smallholder farmer market opportunities and creating kind of priming the pump to get things moving along. And so here's what I think has been one of the greatest innovations in the last 20 years, 30 years, is in my opinion, the United Nations shunned the private sector. But it's an extraordinary uh, new spirit at the United Nations in that how can the private sector help us solve the problems out there? And so what we're doing now, whether it's with the Unilevers, the DSM, Geraldine and I have had several conversations just in the past couple of weeks, along with Bayer, Yara, and the, and the list of companies that goes on. My question is not how, not how can the private sector help the United Nations, but how can the United Nations help the private sector be more strategic, more engaged in countries around the world? From Yes, we're working on uh, post uh, harvest losses, better hermetic practices, and we could delve into that uh, to a great degree, but not enough time here. But one of the things that I was talking with Geraldine a, a couple of weeks ago, along with some other CEOs, is the private sector, and particularly in small holder in developing nations, how can you bring your practices there, integrate, but not displace the small holder farmers, but actually integrate them more strategically? Because if we don't, if we continue the same path, we're gonna have destabilization when we displace workforce. So we've gotta be more efficient, but more strategic and politically sensitive at the same time. And let me make this one last comment because people say the food systems uh, is broken. It's not broken. 200 years ago, 95% of the people on earth were in extreme poverty. And that was with 1.1 billion people. Today, 7.7 .7 billion, less than 10% of the people are in extreme poverty. Now, so we built and designed system that really is improved and substantial success, but try telling that to the 10% that aren't getting an appreciation of this great asset uh, you know, sharing. 
And so we've got to continue to work the system. We've got to make certain that we are more less vulnerable to COVID-type uh, impacts. There are going to be more of those. And as I've told folks, if you think you had trouble getting toilet paper in New York because of supply chain disruption, what do you think is happening in Chad and Niger and Mali and places like that? So we do need to work to improve the system, but we do need to make sure we don't tear down the system that are reaching 90% of the world's population. We've got a lot of work to do, a lot of innovation, a lot of creativity. And as the prime minister said, it's not just one size fits all. And Hiroko, we've got to continue to try all these different dynamics because I can tell you, and I know I need to wrap this up, but just in the past few years with our beneficiaries and ecosystems and, and trying to environmentally improve the planet, our beneficiaries who, who, who reap the consequences of the wealthy nation's carbon consumption, consumption, our beneficiaries just in the last few years literally planted over 6 billion trees we rehabilitated over three and a half million acres of land using half moons and, and just basic fundamental practices that are just absolutely critical to the people surviving in some of these areas because of flash floods and droughts. And just in the last couple of years, over 53,000 holding ponds, reservoirs, wells. And so one of the things that I tell donors, if you will work with us and what we can do, because we have about 10, we, we assist about 100 million people, but 10 million of them are engaged in building water wells and road feeder roads. And I can keep going on because quite David, frankly, I think, yeah. I think, anyway, uh, Hiroka, let me throw it back to you. I'm going to cut you short <laughs> now because I think you can list all the, all, all the achievements and we'll run out of time. Um, when we talk about the food system, you're right. Um, the humanity has been extremely uh, successful in being able to provide more food in the 20th century, but that is now uh, giving us a backlash of, um, you know, it, it, it is the environment footprint, the carbon footprint being, is being hard, it, it is uh, de soil degradation, and, and so much, um, it is not sustainable. And experts say, and I want to ask um, perhaps Geraldine, they say that we know what to do. And I think the understanding that the food system needs to change is spreading, but action gap is the big problem. Action doesn't get scaled up. So what is the missing link um, of this uh, issue? Is it the sort of the sense of urgency is not being shared or is it the finance or is it the policy? If you put your finger on the problem, what do you think um, is the problem of not being able to um, scale up action? Hiroko, I love your question because this is really where I get a lot of energy looking at 2021. And the reason I say this is if we look back to the year of the COVID pandemic, what it has brought to light is that these crises don't stop at borders everyone gets impacted. And when we discussed with David, the number of people on the brink of starvation, it's the combination of, uh, of the issues that we knew before, mm -hmm. plus climate change, plus COVID. And when you put all of that, you see a tripling of people on the brink of starvation. Now, I truly believe that in 2021, the sense of urgency is finally going to come out that when we talk about climate change, the first place it's going to hit, and it will hit everybody, is food. When food goes wrong, there's social in, uh, instability, there's economic issues, there's migration, there's all sorts of disruption. However, this year we have COP26, we have the UN Food System Summit, and when you put those two together, it is the perfect platform to first and foremost actually create the burning platform realization that this is right now. And you're absolutely right. The food issues, yes, it's about quantity, but it's also about how it's produced and whether it's nutritious. And a lot of the focus has been about quantity of food to meet the number of people, but how we produce it is either a spiraling downward issue of degradation of the ecosystems, or it can be a spiraling up 
of doing it in the right way for the planet, but also for the consumers. But it all starts with awareness. I truly believe that the human race, actually once it really realizes the crisis is there, it can act very fast. And we saw it last year, the speed at which everybody across society reacted to the threat of the pandemic, whether it be on innovation, new policies, new behaviors, new technologies, it was a matter of days, it wasn't even weeks. So I think our biggest priority for all of us listening to this is how do we, not in a kind of exaggerated way, but very factually based, raise the awareness that climate change is first and foremost a challenge to our, to our sustainable food systems, and that is where efforts need to go. Finance technology can be arranged. Mm. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, um, as Geraldine said, if this present situation is compounded with uh, climate change, we should be very aware that there might be a rapid collapse of the food production. And this sense of urgency is um, spreading, but not probably enough. What, from your point of view, what is missing in trying to um, scale up the efforts and the transformation? Well, I, I think that is the, the core question which we need to address. And, and, and I would like to build and amplify on what both David and Geraldine have been saying. And we all have seen the, uh, the cartoon, uh, I think, in the uh, pre-meeting uh, material where we see the, uh, the waves of COVID, but then the recession, the climate change and the biodiversity collapse. Mm -hmm. And I think that's e exactly what, what, we are, what we are facing at the moment. And I, uh, I, I would argue, but I would love to hear the views of the other members on the panel, that we need to do a few things at the same time. Crucial here is, I believe, a, a whole of society uh, a whole society approach. And that means that, um, of course, as I think we're all saying, the private sector needs to be on board. Th there we have the scalability. It is the entire uh, value chain from, from farm uh, uh, to fork, uh, so to say. Uh, and there, uh, I think it was also um, the executive director, David, building on uh, mentioning this, the small, the medium-sized and the large businesses like DSM, um, working together because they collectively feed the world. It's not governments feeding the world. It is, it is the whole of um, uh, of the uh, value chain doing this. And that means that uh, I believe there are some great promises when we look uh, uh, forward, and which will also help us in getting the rest of society on board. And one. Uh, uh, always has to be the technological uh, innovation. Just to mention one example, uh, we have here in the Netherlands the project Geodata for Water and Agriculture, uh, where digital tools help smallholders to learn how to sustainably raise their uh, uh, production. So it is a very practical tool uh, which helps smallholders in all parts of the world. And a second one I'd like to mention is uh, how can we work on uh, uh, generally sustainable uh, agricultural uh, practices, uh, circular agriculture, uh, agroecology, uh, and above all, climate smart agriculture, as we have discussed so many times also at the World Economic uh, um, uh, Forum. Uh, and uh, we have seen a recent report, uh, the International Finance Corporation says that climate smart agriculture has the highest green job creation potential of the 10 sectors studied, 40 jobs per million dollars invested. And, and, and my vision for the future is that we will anyway will see in many countries that, for example, in the Netherlands, we have 10 million jobs in the Netherlands. In 2030, probably two to three million of those jobs we do not know of at the moment. We do not know where these jobs will be, uh, but we do know that many of these jobs here in the Netherlands have to, will be linked somehow to the food industry, to the whole of the supply chain uh, in, in the food sector. Uh, and this, this report shows you what the enormous impact on society is. So I would, in closing, would say it is, yes, and the urgency of now that we have to fight these uh, waves, uh, uh, like the cartoon is uh, putting on the table in the, in the material for this meeting. But at the same time, we also have to stress the positive that so much future growth potential and new jobs will come out of the innovations we are putting on the table now. And that will help us to come out of the COVID-19 crisis, to fight the recession, it will fight climate change, it will prevent the biodiversity collapse, 
So there are so many uh, opportunities here at the same time. Yeah, so it would be wonderful if we could create a positive cycle um, of the positive environment and positive employment and growth and so forth. Uh, Jeffrey, your sector is uh, dairy, and I think the major issue is the greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, what you have to do is to uh, improve the, uh, the nutrition of the uh, Chinese people by um, promoting um, dairy products. But at the same time, you have to um, uh, decrease the carbon footprint because uh, animal protein is providing so much um, burden on the environment. What are the uh, technologies and innovations that you are trying to adopt? Um, thank you. I, I think, you know, if, if, I, if you look at our industry, I have a couple of things to, to share uh, based on this, uh, this issue. Uh, the first thing I think is, is a leadership issue. I think that you need require a very strong local leadership that share the same vision to achieve whatever we have agreed to, right? So we just said that by 2030, we will be reaching, China will be reaching the highest in terms of the CO2 um, emission. And then by 2060, we will be getting into neutral. So that is important. Once we set that mission, we will have to drive into that. Now, come back to particular what we are doing today is actually uh, just uh, some of uh, the speaker have already shared, the technology we are now already start to share with our farmers is to help them to grow feeds, use less water, um, and also use less feeds when they feed the, the cows. We have implemented already a digital um, system uh, on each of the cows. So we know the health si situation of each cow and how much they eat, how many water they eat, and what are they producing. So you know exactly that the, in the level of um, consumption at each uh, key point of the supply chain. So that will actually reduce already by 25% of the feed that go into the farms. And then obviously to produce one liter of milk, you have much less of a CO2 emission. So just taking that as, as an example, at the same time, we are also working on new technology to work on plant-based as well, because as you know, uh, as uh, we are also working on a, a food nutrition platform for the consumer. At the same time, when we do education with consumer, we also talk about packaging, green packaging. We also talk about the waste. So we, along the way, for example, the recycling of our packaging have been also a significant one when we do a test in, in a case like Shanghai, we are able to achieve 95% of the recycle of the package. So that, that's also a very significant move. But again, coming back to, to, my, to my point, it has to be a clear leadership, a shared vision, and then along the way, a roadmap for every sector. I think every sector, have, private sector, have their own you know, issues about food system. But if we have that, and if we have a roadmap of actions, I'm sure it will significantly help it for the transformation of the entire food system. Thank you. Um, Jeffrey mentioned leadership. My question is, is there enough leadership? I've been hearing a lot about um, transformation of energy and climate change. And not, I haven't heard um, leaders speak about um, the food system change so much. So you, David and um, Mr. Prime Minister, you mentioned about the food summit and that there's a nutrition summit also, and there's COP. Um, we are lacking leadership in this field. I wonder um, how you can mobilize more leadership action. Um, David, um, or Mr. Prime Minister, uh, who wants to take this question? Well. I always yield to the prime minister. <laughs> <laughs>
but it, but let me say this. One of the things that bothered me in the last few years, uh, because we had crises all over the world from climate extremes, war, and the number of people marching to the brink of starvation. When I arrived four years ago at the World Food Program, it was 80 million people. And then pre-COVID, it spiked to 135 million. The question was why? Man-made conflict wars and conflicts in dozens of places all over the world, and then climate extremes on top of that. And what was happening in the international media, you turned on the news around the world, it was Trump, 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 or Brexit, 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 now COVID, COVID, and we literally had hundreds of millions of people on the brink of starvation and the media just wasn't covering it. But now people are beginning to wake up and step up. COVID, I think, exacerbated a vulnerable supply chain system and food systems of which so much success has been made, but it's very vulnerable and we've got a lot more work to do because what leaders are now beginning to recognize and this is, this is the reality we're facing in 2021 with 270 million people on the brink of starvation. If we don't receive the support and the funds that we need, you will have mass famine, starvation, you'll have destabilization of nations, and you'll have mass migration. And the cost of that is a thousand times more. So I believe you're beginning to see leaders step up and recognize we need to address short-term and long-term solutions. And like the prime minister stepping up here, I think this is just a good example of the future that leaders, because the United Nations Security Council for the first time passed a resolution recognizing clearly the correlation between food security and political stability and safety and security of nations. So I think we're on a new path now. Now we've got to act on it and move forward. Mr. Prime Minister, can you mobilize more leadership? I, I will do whatever I can. And, and uh, if David uh, uh, helps me uh, and Geraldine and Jeffrey, then, then we can do that. But let me just underpin that, because when you look at the numbers, uh, 840 million people worldwide are not assured uh, of access to enough food. I mean, this, this number is staggering. Secondly, um, the, the various crises we are the world is, is, is faced with, not just COVID, but coming after COVID, recession, the climate change, and, and the uh, biodiversity collapse. And at the same time, the huge opportunity in terms of future um, um, job creation, which will be necessary to fight off the recession, which will be necessary to fight off climate change and therefore the biodiversity collapse. Um, and that's why I think the three themes coming through in this, in this meeting are so crucial, which is, yes, we need the world on board, the UN system on board. Yes, we need the uh, uh, technological uh, innovations. Uh, and at the same time, we need uh, the scalability power of our small, but also our medium-sized and bigger worldwide operating uh, uh, companies. And when we do that in conjunction, uh, the case for change is, is, is enormous and is compelling and is in your face, both on the dramatic side as well as uh, to, be the, to be a bit more optimistic on the opportunity side. And I think if we can collectively do this. And then finally, when leaders are talking about that, it's crucial that they are not just pontificating these things in meetings like this, but also show, and I will see what I can do more in this area, also show at the national level what they do in their national dialogues uh, to make this, make this happen. And that will also add to the, um, uh, yeah, let's say, um, whether it is believable what they are saying, whether other people believe what they are saying, uh, because it is uh, putting the, the money where the mouth is, they are putting um, words into action, and that also has to be done at the national level. Of course, that is where uh, national leaders are most effective, and from which they will get um, their uh, authority uh, to talk about these issues in panels like this. And I'm not saying I'm the perfect example here, because we are doing not enough on this issue, but I will uh, promise you that we will do more on this, and also at the national level, so that next time I can speak with more authority uh, on this issue. Okay, thank you. Maybe this is the last question I'd like to pose it to Geraldine. What will be, we need more business participation uh, we need to stimulate the business activity in the field. What is missing? Ah, what is missing? Um, 
I think what is missing is a collective belief that we can make the change happen fast. I think there is a certain view that in the food system, things take a long time and that therefore it's a very gradual, progressive process uh, when in fact change can happen fast. And when we align all of our technologies end to end, we can make the difference. And for me, what really is missing, if I think practically about what's been in our our way. It's the ability to connect from end to end, from the, the planetary impact of producing the raw materials of food to the processing, to the consumer diets choices, and the transparency across that. So our biggest challenge as an industry is to see how do we connect all together uh, with the help of the public sector, with the help of the NGOs to make it happen, that we have this transparency across end to end. And, and I would like to add a, a little wink to the work on the ESG disclosures, um, because I think the more companies report as a private sector, how we contribute to the SDGs, how we contribute to the non-financial uh, impacts of our activities, the more this will help us connect both upstream and downstream to work together. So the convergence on ESG disclosures is also a very important step that is happening right now. Okay, we're out of time. I'd like to thank all the panelists for joining us. And uh, if I may, add uh, just one point. Um, uh, just Jeffrey, adding that. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I was. If I were to add one point on mm -hmm. what Geraldine said, I think it's also along the along the long chain of all these partners who should take it positively. When you talk about this. You know, people might think it's a negative thing, but there's a huge of opportunity in this area no? on technology, on efficiency, on creating new jobs. So all these partners, when they are joining, you should have a common belief it is positive. It will generate more positive impact financially, but also economic, uh, 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 socially. Really agree. Sorry. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> We're out of time. Thank you all for joining us, and uh, goodbye.